morning, everybody. Hopefully everybody's doing well. So these are my disclosures, nothing pertinent for this talk. So why pedal access? I think the main reason are CTOs, as we just saw, you know, Fadi showed a great demonstration. CTO crossing failure rate is still about 20 to 50%, depending on the experience of the operator. And so this is one of the advantages of being able to do dual access, or in this case, retrograde access, et cetera. There are also other reasons to, to choose pedal access uh, in, in many patients. Morbid obesity, a hostile groin, either from multiple surgeries or prior radiation, severely diseased uh, CFA disease, uh, patients uh, who are unable to lay flat completely. If you've got acute angulations of the aortic bifurcation, you've reconstructed it from prior stenting or EVAR uh, treatments or you know patients who have had aortal bifemoral grafts. Obviously, there are advantages uh, uh, to pedal access. As we just saw here, the ability to cross the CTO is really probably the main reason, right? If you can't cross the CTO, you can't deliver therapy, and then we can't prevent uh, an amputation and save a limb. But it also gives you other advantages. Other advantages including sometimes being able to cross the CTO more quickly, shorten your procedure time. Uh, you've got shorter devices, catheters, delivery systems that you can use. And then in some cases, as, as Fadi has described, you know, and many times and has written about this, is you can fix things primarily from a retrograde or pedal access, so-called TAMI technique or TAMI procedure. Uh, obviously, with pedal access, you get quicker and uh, hemostasis is much easier, quicker time to ambulation, quicker discharge, which leads to really improved patient satisfaction. And then we talked about sometimes shortening procedure times. So here's an example of that. Here's a case, CLI patient who has multiple uh, small ulcerations involving the toes. You can see here that we've got a popliteal artery occlusion, and you can see that proximal cap is relatively ambiguous with multiple large collaterals coming off of it. You may be able to uh, cross this in an antegrade fashion. You may not. In this case, you know, I, I was unsuccessful from above, so I, I opted to access the occluded anterior tibial artery in this case because we have a single vessel posterior tibial artery runoff, so I wanted to protect that. And so I accessed that, and then as you can see here that, yeah, whoops, sorry, uh, can we go back one slide, please, or two slides, one more? Yeah, there you go. So as you can see here, you know, this was basically our route, and you can see that we were able to cross this CTO in really rapid fashion from below, despite uh, having difficulty from above. And you can see we were able to achieve inline flow. You can see that there's a little stump of an anterior tibial artery on that middle image. But look at the improved perfusion uh, on the lateral foot. It's a significant advantage there. So when you're talking about pedal access, you want to stay as distal as possible, right? As you move higher up in the leg, the, as my surgical colleagues will tell you, the compartments become larger. Your risk for uh, compartment syndrome if you have a complication or, or, or bleeding for whatever reason is increased. And so you want to stay as distal as possible if you can. So what are the types of guidance that we have? We've obviously got ultrasound guidance. We just saw a great example of that. But we've also got fluoroscopy. And there's really the most common is angiography or contrast guided. But remember, in many of these CLI patients who have intimal and medial calcification uh, and adventitial calcification, you can also use calcium guided. And let's look at some examples. These are a couple of videos really just to show you uh, some normal anatomy of the anterior tibial and posterior tibial arteries. You can see that they're associated with their paired veins. You can see on that top right that the perineal artery, although you can see it with ultrasound, is pretty deep structure and it's very difficult to see and sometimes getting into it with ultrasound is, is not possible. And remember, these are normal arteries that I'm showing you. Most of the vessels you're going to see are going to uh, look like that lower right image or worse. And sometimes they're difficult, difficult to visualize and figure out where you are. Obviously, when it comes to ultrasound guidance, as Fadi just showed a great example of, there's many angles or, uh, that you can use to achieve access into the tibial vessel. The ideal would be the 12 o'clock position. Many operators will do a Seldinger technique, as Fadi did when you're dealing with a, a disease or an occluded vessel. And then as you saw in his example, you can see that he basically then, his ultrasonographer went into the longitudinal or sagittal plane to really show you where the needle was and where the walls of the vessel were. These are two videos that are courtesy of Fadi, actually. They're from him as well. And you can see where the red arrows are. We're accessing the anterior tibial artery. You can see he's moving the needle back and forth to figure out where the 12 o'clock position is. Once he gets uh, access either within the lumen or he does a double wall or so-called Seldinger technique, 
you can see then he moves to a longitudinal view and look at how well you can see the guide wire uh, inside the vessel. And I think that's the key. EVIS or extravascular ultrasound has a lot of advantages, not only for guidance, but also for visualizing CTO caps and crossing CTOs. There are a couple of uh, important ultrasound findings you want to know if you are going to start doing more and more ultrasound guided access procedures. <clears throat> the first two are the so-called Janali gaps. So when you have tibial vessels and you have gaps in the, in the calcification, as you can see here on the longitudinal image, those are areas of negative remodeling or degeneration of the vessel. There's really no wall there, and so your likelihood of crossing uh, becomes more difficult or sometimes impossible. Then there's the, uh, the, the top two right images. You can see there's basically dense calcification, you know, like a rock or a boulder filling the lumen. This is a so-called white stop sign really described by Jihad Mustafa and Fadi Saab. Uh, you know, several years ago, and that's another negative process. Uh, it's a negative uh, um, predictor of, of being able to cross uh, through a CTO, as you can see in this example below. When it comes to fluoro guided access, obviously we've got two ways we can do it. This is the most common, using angiography to visualize the vessel. You use a micropuncture set, different tools. You get access, you advance your wire. Remember, though, in many of these CLI patients, because of diabetes and CKD, they have heavy, heavy intimal and medial arterial calcification as well as and adventitial calcification. And you can see here that we are accessing the distal anterior tibial artery near the ankle joint um, with purely with calcium and no angiography. So let's look at a case. Here's a classic CLI patient with diabetes and CKD, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, all the risk factors you'd expect with CLI. Really had a popliteal artery occlusion around the knee joint. You can see there's really no named vessels below the, uh, the knee with the exception of a reconstituted distal posterior tibial artery. So again, in this patient, you know, we, we opted to come from above. We knew that we would need retrograde access to try to uh, in this advanced limb salvage case. And you can see basically with ultrasound, I was able to see a hibernating dorsalis pedis artery. So that means a, a vessel that is open but angiographically occult because of a proximal occlusion. You can't see it with angiograms. We were able to access that. You can use, see that I typically use, just like Fadi was saying, a V18, Command 18. These are all great guide wires. You want relatively low tip loads, things that can knuckle. Uh, so you can use various CTO techniques to get through. You can see this is a classic knuckle wire technique. We were able to get access. You can see here with EVIS, it's a classic example of showing you that we were intraluminal with ultrasound. You can see the tip of the sheath in the middle image there with the red arrow to, again, show you that we are intraluminal, not subintimal. And exactly what Art was talking about, I have a sheath in this distal vessel. And so when I was doing good vessel prep, in this case, orbital atherectomy, you can see I opened the sheath. I let any debris, any particulate matter clear out. It's an advantage for preventing distal embolization. We're ultimately able to then eventually reconstruct a, a nice two-vessel runoff. We had a lot of hibernating vessels uh, below the ankle, as you can see here, with a relatively intact pedal loop. And you can see we have a nice CLI endpoint, right? We've got a nice angiographic wound blush. We know that that is a good predictor of, of future healing. And so with good wound care and HBOT, we were able to get significant healing in this case. So what's your exit strategy once you have this? There's many ways to do this. Well, in the previous case, you can see that since we were fixing the anterior tibial and dorsalis pedis artery, we basically took out our sheath. You can see there's extravasation at the access site. We crossed distal to that access site using a combination of fluoro and ultrasound, and then we delivered therapy in order to achieve hemostasis. Here's another example where we were not fixing the posterior tibial artery, but we used it for access to help cross a FEMPOP CTO. You can see that we've got extravasation of contrast, and this is a simple fix. Put your finger on it, light pressure, hold it for a few minutes, that's it. You don't need to put a balloon, you don't need to use any fancy angioplasty or anything like that, because these will basically heal and, and uh, stop uh, pretty quickly. What about positioning? Well, obviously, if we're going to access the anterior tibial artery, the dorsalis pedis artery, this is how you want to position the leg. Remember that when you're looking at the anterior tibial artery, that if you dorsiflex the foot, you're obviously going to get some kinking or angulation in the distal AT and the proximal DP, which then resolves with plantar flexion. So that's something to, to realize when you're positioning and, and, and looking to gain access. Posterior tibial artery, this is the classic positioning that you want to use. You can see this is how you would access the posterior tibial artery. And in this case, it's the opposite of the anterior tibia. When you have dorsiflexion, you straighten out that distal PT, which makes it a little bit easier to access. When you do plantar flexion, you can see that you get that kinking or curving and so forth. 